The idea is that if you have a bunch of scores, it's helpful to summarize them rather than to just give someone all the scores you have, especially if you have a whole bunch of scores. Say you recorded temperature in San Juan, Puerto Rico every day at noon for three years. You can't just email someone a list of a thousand temperature readings and be like, here you go. You really ought to describe those temperature readings somehow, make an overall picture, or maybe even be able to say what a typical temperature might be. I'm going to run through three measures of central tendency, mean, median, and mode. I'm sure that you already know these words, so this will be brief. With anything we do in statistics, I want you to keep purpose in the back of your mind. With every concept, ask yourself, what does this thing tell me? And what does it not tell me? Let's do that for central tendency. The purpose of these measures of central tendency is to represent a typical score. That is their job. Keep that in mind, to represent a typical score. I'm going to start with the most simple measure, the mode. The mode is the most frequently occurring score in a set of data. If you have a picture or a graph, such as a histogram, the mode is the highest point on that graph because that's where the frequency is the highest. The mode is nothing more than that, though. It's the highest point on the graph. It's the most popular score. It's the team with the most players. It can be anywhere in the distribution, in the middle or the right. The highest point is the mode. If there are two high points, then there are two modes. What if I'm asking everyone, what is your favorite movie of all time? Then my scores are names of movies, right? And I can't average names of movies or do math with such data. I can't get scores like Hunger Games and X-Men and then average them to get Mission Impossible or something. That won't work. What can I do? I can count them up, that's all. And that's a nominal variable here, also known as a categorical variable. The scores are words, names, categories. You can find the mode for any type of data at all because all that's required is that you count up the scores. But the only measure of central tendency that you can possibly use for nominal data is the mode. The median is the middle score when the data are put in order from low to high. Half the scores are on each side of the median. The median is the midpoint. So that we can put scores in order from low to high, they do have to be on a variable that gives us that information. Nominal data don't tell us what order they go in, so there's no median for nominal data. We can find the median for any variable that we can sort in order from low to high somehow, ordinal, equal, interval, ratio, scale. One more thing, since medians divide the data in half, sometimes people use things called quartiles. Quartiles divide each half in half again. So you have quarters or quartiles to use the correct term. You know, think of four quarters that add up to $1 or 100%. Where you might see quartiles used is when people want to represent like the middle 50% of something. The middle 50% would be between the first quartile and the third quartile. Moving on to the measure of central tendency you have all been waiting for, the one, the only, the mean. The mean is what you think it is. Add them up and divide by how many scores you have. The mean is really the balance point in a distribution, and I'll come back to that shortly. Remember what the purpose is of these measures of central tendency to represent a typical score. And the mean is by far the most commonly used measure of central tendency. It comes in pretty handy for pretty much everything else we do in a statistics course. Quick example here. Look at grades someone has in some course. And here they are. What's the mean? You add them up and divide by 6, and the mean is about 68.3. The question to ask here, because we want to represent a typical score, is would you describe this kid as a D student? See, if I had to guess what he'd get on his next quiz, I'd probably guess about an 80. I also see that 80 is the median, which does a better job representing a typical score in this case. Obviously, the point of this little illustration is to remind you that the mean is the measure that is most influenced by extreme scores. That extreme score, in this case the zero, pulls the mean toward it and away from the center. Distributions that are skewed do this too. I want to talk about that balance point idea here, which might help. I just googled mean balance point and got 76 million results. This tells me you might have heard this concept before. 
And I think it can help understand the relative positions of the measures of central tendency, as well as the basic functioning of the mean and deviation scores and how they cancel. Let's look at an image. Suppose this little drawing is a seesaw, like what kids sit on at the park. And now I'm going to label some little numbers here so you can think of it like a number line. And I'm going to use little X's to represent grades, okay? Let's pretend this is for me, and I need an 85 in this course for some reason. My first grade's an 82. Okay, that's lower than what I need. Suppose my second grade is an 89. That works out, because now the mean is above 85, as you can see from the tilt there. 85 is not the balance point. Numerically, look at the deviation scores to find the balance point. The mean is that balance, so right now the mean is 85.5. And I could keep doing this. Every time I put another grade into the data set, the mean will shift to keep the balance. The deviation scores cancel out around the mean. Of course, if I add a score that equals the mean at that moment, the mean won't move. Let me just add in here real quick 10 grades. Right, where is my balance point now? Did I get my 85 or not? You can see I did. And that's good because I was really worried about my pretend grades here. But just to finish this up, let's look at the arithmetic for the mean to show that my balance point really is the mean. And there you have it, the mean is a balance point. And every statistics textbook has a little explanation of mean as balance point as well, so check that out. Our last segment here is dedicated to the weighted mean. And we're just going to do this right through examples. Say the first 10 shoppers on Friday at some store spend an average of $60. And then the first 10 shoppers on Saturday at the same store spend an average of $100. What's the overall average for all 20 shoppers there? We can say easily that the grand mean for all 20 shoppers is 80 bucks. We can do this because the samples are the same size. We do often have to average sample means when the samples are not the same exact size. So let's look at that. Suppose the first five shoppers on Friday spend an average of $60 and the first 15 shoppers on Saturday spend an average of $100. Alright, so we got 5 on Friday, and the mean is $60. And then 15 on Saturday, and the mean is $100. When we say we need the weighted mean, we're asking what is the mean for all 20 of these people? And it's not $80. Way more people spent the $100 than those who spent $60, right? So that bigger sample's mean has to have more weight it counts more toward the overall or grand mean for all the people from both samples. Now we don't have those 20 individual scores to get the mean for them, but we don't need that kind of detail. Look at it this way. We want to know the mean spending per person considering all 20 people. How much money was spent on Friday by the Friday people? There were five of them and they spent $60 on average each. $300 was spent on Friday. And how much money was spent on Saturday by that sample? 15 of them spent an average of $100, so $1,500 was spent on Saturday, right? So there we have $1,800 total spent by our 20 shoppers. The overall mean for all 20 shoppers then is $1,800 divided by 20, or $90 per shopper. The formula for what we just did would look like this. And on that statistical note, this mini-video lecture on central tendency is done.